morning, everyone. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. I would stand and we'll get started. Morning, Stuart Heights. We're happy to have everybody here, both in the sanctuary and online. 
I want to tell you about just a couple announcements. August 7th coming up, this is going to be our promotion Sunday. We've got our church picnic and our lake baptisms coming up, so make sure you keep that in your calendar. And August 14th, all normal Sunday evening uh, activities resume as well as the morning services, so we want you to keep those on your mind. Um, Romans 5.8 talks about, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That verse doesn't state it gen generally in speaking that God just showed the way that love can be lived out, but it says he demonstrated it for us. He demonstrated for us. So it was personal, him wanting to show his love for us. The next two songs that we're gonna sing, this first one really speaks about Jesus's ultimate example, dying on the cross to show his love for each person in this room. And then the second song that we'll sing here in a minute really talks about how we can love him back and what it looks like in our life to live life with him daily, loving on him and leaning on him. And so I uh, think about that as we praise him this morning in song. Seed on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side. No greater sacrifice. What he sins are forgiven my future is heaven I praise God for what he's done for the freedom he has won even death is dead and done his life has overcome Say the name above all names over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. What he has done, what he has done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is saved.
Let the King of my heart be a mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my son. And let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my son, cause you are great. was awesome, huh? I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. You happy to be here today? Amen and amen to that. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your love and your goodness. What beautiful music and hymns that you've given to us, Father, to reflect upon you and your goodness, and you are a good, good God. 
Lord, thank you for all that you provide for us. Father, for this message today that's gonna be presented, Lord, I just pray that you'll be with David as he shares. Father, there's a lot of challenging moments for each and every one of us out there on a day-by-day basis. And we just, Father, we wanna be aware of those. We just wanna give you praise and glory for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the music this morning. Thank you for the prayer, Gary. Thank you so much for that. Uh, for those of you who have been, it's been, it's been a little while since I've been here on the, on the Chattanooga campus with you all. Uh, my name's David McNabb, and um, I am the executive director of Adult and Teen Challenge Mid-South here in Chattanooga. As of about five and a half years ago, I guess, uh, stepped away from the ministry in the local church to go down and take that position. And um, shortly after leaving uh, the, the pastor position where I was and coming to Stewart Heights to be a part of your fellowship, I became uh, quick friends with uh, Daryl Davenport, as he has a tendency to do with, with, new, with new blood that circulates in. And so uh, Daryl and I got to be good friends. And shortly thereafter, uh, Stewart Heights began to, in a very, very great way, uh, uh, to support the ministry of Adult and Teen Challenge. Uh, this, what you see on the screen behind you here, flashing behind you, is um, uh, some baptisms that took place on our campus uh, throughout the course of this year. Um, if, you go, if you make it all the way to the end, I'm sure you will. Uh, they're coming up for two seconds or so. Eventually, you're going to see that on these two particular days, we had 26 men and women, women uh, came to make a profession of faith and to signify that profession of faith by following through with baptism. Now, with any church, you know, it's, it's always that we love to have uh, what we call uh, biological growth. We love it when little ones are born into the fellowship and they grow up, and we love it when they go to children's camp and youth camp and, and uh, make decisions for Christ and have baptism. That's an awesome thing. But uh, one thing that is very, very special to me, having been in ministry for some time, is to see someone make a commitment to Christ when, you are, uh, when you're an adult. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of decision, especially where these men and women have come from with all kinds of, uh, of chaos and poor decisions in their background. They came to Adult and Teen Challenge. They're exposed to the gospel. And uh, by God's grace, uh, many of them uh, find a relationship with Jesus Christ and they pursue him as best they can. Now, what will happen to these men and women once they come out of the baptism water and they start about, about the living life? Uh, is a matter of prayer for all of us because just as anyone else comes out of, of, of uh, the baptism and uh, desires to walk a, a life that's obedient to Christ, it is a battle. And for many of them, they return back to homes and families that are, uh, well, let's just say, not as supportive as many of ours may have been. And so we pray for them, but we, uh, we know that there was a moment in time when they allowed themselves to make that confession that Jesus Christ is Lord and allowed someone else to place them under the water of baptism. What you, what you saw up there was, um, was a, a portable baptistry that was courtesy of Chattanooga Funeral Home. My friend Stephen Pica, back about three or four years ago, made a donation and allowed us to have that, that, uh, that portable baptistry that has a heater. Uh, you can be fully submerged in water, and then uh, it's it's a, and be rolled away into a safe place. So it's a neat it's a neat little contraption that we have down there, and that all took place on our on our campus in our pavilion. So I say all of that to say this: that we appreciate the ministry of Stewart Heights Baptist Church so much because it is your support of your tithes and offerings going to for, to support this church to go toward the, the missions ministries that we uh, that you support both here and abroad that allows this kind of stuff to take place and uh, I know when I first got to Adult and Teen Challenge I would say our top two or three uh, uh, churches probably were a, a Lookout Mountain Presbyterian, Signal Mountain Presbyterian. For some reason, we've had a ministry of Presbyterians for all these years. Not sure why that is, but uh, they've always been very gener generous to us. But I would say now uh, that Stuart Heights would be in the top five of uh, financial support for the Ministry of Adult and Teen Challenge, and we appreciate you all so much. Uh, my wife and I made a decision several years ago that when it comes to outside of the offerings that we give to church, we are not going to support any ministry any, any organization whatsoever that does not have an eternal impact in terms of souls. 
And I want to let you know that whatever is given by Stuart Heights to Adult and Teen Challenge goes to sow the gospel in the hearts of men and women whose lives have been absolute chaos. And uh, we pray that uh, they will walk faithfully from that day forward. But uh, anyway, we thank you for your support, and we appreciate y'all so much. And uh, if, you, if you were able to count those, those were 26 folks so far this year, just this year. And so it looks like we could be on track for many more than that. So uh, with, uh, with God's grace and your prayers, we will continue to see a harvest that's going to be taking place of those that the enemy has had in his clutches for so long, having to release them to the power of God and the gospel. So we are thankful, most thankful for all of that that's going on. All right? Amen. So thank you very, very much. All right, all of that being said, um, this morning I have a message that has come, actually it has come from a place of frustration in my soul. Uh, for, to a great extent, um, we see a lot of the, of the uh, result of um, bad parenting. Uh, we see the results of trauma of abuse, of all kinds of other things uh, at Adult and Teen Challenge that, that ma manifests itself in addiction. But in many cases, we also see the, what's taken place when we do not take, uh, take seriously the fact that we are in a spiritual battle, each and every one of us. And this morning, I'd like to share with you a message that I've entitled briefly, Know Your Enemy. Know your enemy. Now, if we are to successfully overcome an opponent, it is always a good idea that we know their strategy, we know their weapons, and if it's possible for us to know their end game, what their goal is, that in itself is a benefit as well. And so this morning, we're going to talk about a little bit. We're going to talk about Satan for a while this morning. And uh, for us, he is our enemy in case you've forgotten. And, uh, but I want you to know that uh, as surely as there is a God in heaven and a Holy Spirit living in each and every one of us, there is a devil who is doing his very best to make sure that he steals all of God's glory he possibly can and undermines the work of God as best he can in the world that he's doing even now. Now, spiritual warfare is real. It is present or else that Paul would not have told us that on a daily basis we should be putting on the full armor of God in order that we might be able to stand against the attacks of the devil. Now, to be victorious in spiritual warfare, you do not have to be weird or spooky. All right. Now, it depends on your background, where you may have come from. Uh, some denominations, some churches, one church in particular that I served in for, for several years, was very, very preoccupied with the idea of spiritual warfare. And that's good. But there can come a time where we see a demon behind every bush. Okay? Let just suffice it to say this. We can be victorious in the warfare against our enemy without knowing the name of every demon that we confront. Okay? In fact, the scripture talks about the fact that all authority has been given to Jesus Christ in heaven and earth. He is the authority. He is the one who is, has the ability to rebuke the enemy, to cast out the devil, and make sure that we have been kept safe. But it is upon us to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in His grace, and to be ever mindful and alert that, friends, on any given moment in time, we can be surprised by the power of the enemy. We can be surprised by something we did not see coming, and we can find ourselves having to regain our footing and reestablish ourselves and make up potentially for lost time and great pain and anguish because we've been caught unaware. Now this morning, what we're going to do very, very, very quickly is to put some things in proper perspective as far as spiritual warfare is concerned. I'm going to date myself with this reference, but back in the 70s, there was a, uh, there was a comedian on, on TV called Flip Wilson. I don't know if anybody remembers Flip Wilson or not. Those, okay, I see a few nods. Okay, there's some folks as old as me. All right. Flip Wilson used to have this cute little statement, this cute little phrase he used all the time, and he would say, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. It was funny. We laughed then. We laugh a little bit now until we find out if we're to be really honest with ourselves, the devil does not make us do anything. I can speak from personal experience to tell you if you see anything evil coming out of me, it is not because the devil made me do it. It is only the fact the fact that I have succumbed to what authority I have allowed him to have in my life. We open up the crack in the door 
We allow our thought process. We allow our devotion to the Lord, our devotion to his word. We allow to have that moment take place. And the next thing you know, we are doing, saying, or otherwise participating in things that are absolutely foreign to who we are and what we believe. And when that takes place, the devil did not make us do it. By our own free will, we allowed ourselves to succumb to that moment, to that temptation, and allow him to take us down a path that we had no desire in going. I knocked that completely off of that microphone. My gracious. I was trying to cleverly just push it aside without breaking it. It's not going to happen. All right, we'll put it right there. I don't think that can hurt us anymore. All right, the first thing I want us to talk about this morning is that our enemy, your enemy, has a specific job description. Now, how do we know he has a job description? Because Jesus told us that he did. And he told us in a very convenient way. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus took a moment to express what it was the thief is about about doing. It's a part of his role as he, as he attacks us in life. It says that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. You have there the two opposites that are opposed to each other. You've got what the enemy does and what Jesus does. And if you take just a moment to consider, the power that the enemy has is limited. But what he does, he takes advantage of every possible opportunity. He said, for example, the enemy plays for keeps. And it may begin with something so simple and so something so benign as maybe over here he may start an argument. And over here he may sow a little discord. But make sure you understand that regardless of how the, the, the enemy may begin to do his work, at the very heart of it, he desires to destroy the work that Jesus Christ has set up to do here in the world. There's, I, I may have said this when I was with you some time ago, but one of the things that I consistently say to our students on campus is this, that the enemy does not come after you in order that he might cause you to stumble or that you might not live up to your fullest potential in life. The enemy comes to after you in order that you might be killed You'd be found in a box with your family huddled around wondering why God was not able to ultimately save you. The enemy plays for keeps. And he wants to inflict as much collateral damage as he possibly can on you, those you love, and if possible, involve the church as well. This is the work the enemy does. And when I say that to the folks that we have on our campus at Adult and Teen Challenge, it resonates with them because they can, they know, they can right now, they can mention, they can call off the names of their friends that they've lost due to a drug overdose. They can remember the, the, the friends that they've lost due to bad decisions that ultimately put them in a car when they were incapable of driving and it cost their li them their lives or the lives of others. So when we talk about the enemy playing for keeps and the fact that he wants you dead in a box with your family grieving, that's exactly his end result, what he strives to do. Friends, I promise you, I would much rather be talking about the power of God's love and what Jesus' life represented to each one of us that enables us to live a productive life. But I'm afraid, friends, sometimes we've come to the place even within our churches where we become so, so complacent in realizing that there we are, in fact, in a battle. You know, it's, this happened over the course of years, and I submit to you, and I mentioned it to Gary in the first service, I don't think it's for lack of teaching in our congregations. But there's something about the society and the culture in which we live that somehow allows us to get to a place where we think everything is going to be okay. It's fine that somehow or another the reality of this battle that we're in somehow is not as real as it used to be. That's the old way of doing church. That's the old way of preaching the gospel. We're at a different place. We're at a different time these days. Oh, we most definitely are. But we've come to a place where the generations after us have no clue of the urgency of what we're faced with every day. 
You know, you've, you've heard on the news, I know over the last couple, two or three years, about the opioid crisis and the things that the drugs and alcohol are doing to our, to our society. Friends, it's worse than what they've sold it. If you can believe the press would actually undersell something, that's what they've actually done, is that the things that are, going, that are taking place even now in our midst, in our families, in church families... We've come to a place where nobody wants to talk about the reality of the struggles that we, ha that we have. And in the family of God, by all, by all means, this should be the place where we find strength. Friends, let's, we, need, we need to be reminded of the fact that we have an enemy who's seeking to destroy us. And unfortunately, the generations that are coming after us are finding somehow or another that he is someone that can be dealt with, somebody who can be negotiated with. And the truth of the matter is he can't. And primarily for one reason, that is their second point for this morning, and that is your enemy has issues with the truth. I worded that a lot more kindly than Jesus did because in chapter 8 of John, verses 42 and following, Jesus says these words, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see where Jesus is making his point? And he wasn't nearly as kind as I was in explaining is that the enemy, the, our, the devil, our adversary is a liar and he is the father of lies. Now, the passage I just read to you is coming from a place, it's actually kind of a unique place. Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders. He's, taking, he's talking to Pharisees and even some of the Jews that have agreed to follow him. And as he's going through this conversation, he begins to talk about how they can experience true freedom in this life. In fact, there's a couple of verses in John chapter 8 that we love down at our campus. And uh, it's interesting how they fall in the context. You remember these words? Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. How about, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Is that not some of the most awesome passages of coming from the, from the mouth of Jesus talking about what comes from a late relationship with him? You can experience freedom unlike you've ever experienced in your life. Yet he's having this in the midst of an argument. He's talking to the Jewish leaders, and he's talking, and he's, and he's defending who he is. He's explaining who he is, and he's talking about the true freedom in life can only come through a relationship with him. And they begin to push back, and they say, no, wait, 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 wait. Freedom? You're talking to us as if we're slaves. Do you not understand that we are descendants of Abraham? And as descendants of Abraham, we have been slaves to no one. Well, now... Friends, if you've studied Scripture more than five minutes, the descendants of Abraham were slaves to everybody. How many times were they taken into captivity? How many They were under Roman rule even now in this passage of Scripture. And yet they were saying, no, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. We are under, we, we, we've never been slaves to anyone. We don't need to appeal to you for our freedom, for we are the children of Abraham. What a vicious lie. See, they believe the lie that somehow because of who you were born to, because of the tradition that you've embraced, because of the faith that you've embraced, that you can have freedom based purely upon that. Jesus didn't even go try to go down that road. He didn't even try to appeal to that sense of understanding because if they can't remember their history enough to know that they have been placed in places of exile, in slavery before, then it was, not, it was, it was all for naught. But Jesus simply said this, guys, listen, you're believing a lie and understand that the one who's selling you this bill of goods, this, this idea of, of religion or tradition or whatever it is being all it takes for you to experience freedom in this life, you have a much more serious issue. If something runs contrary to the word of God, it's pretty easy to find its source. Now, let me give you an example that all of us can identify with, or at least you're familiar with. 
The concept of abortion, women's health care, a woman's natural right to control her body, the life of an infant created in the image of the same God who creates its very heartbeat is being unceremoniously murdered before he or she can take its first breath. And we have been sold the bill of goods that that is a political issue. My friends, the right to be born and to live this life created in the image of God is foundational to who we are as human beings. The audacity to make this issue something that you vote on and for God forbid it go to the Supreme Court to, to rule on. We are created in the image of God. He knows our very day that we're going to be born. He knows the day we're going to die. He knows everything in between. He knew me, but while I was being formed in my mother's womb, I'm borrowing the words of my friend David who, in, in Psalm 139 who said the same thing. He said, listen, before we were born, God saw us and he knew us. And this generation and generations before have believed this lie about humanity, about birth, about procreation and, 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 filling this, and filling this world with those created in the image of God. And we get to the place where we could believe this lie as being something to actually be debated as if it had a, some matter of, 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 of redeeming value. Friends, it is so easy for that which is a lie to be taken as the truth. And it happens when somehow we begin to abandon the power of the word of God. Number three, your enemy preys on the weak. And by the weak, let me clarify exactly what I mean. That does not always mean your, your, physical, your physical stamina, your ability to, uh, to function and do things in this life. I'm not talking about someone who is specifically weak, but I'm talking about that one who might be in a moment of, uh, in a, any particular moment in time, who is spiritually weak or spiritually not alert. First Peter chapter 5, Peter writes these words, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Not always, but in many cases, those that the enemy prowls or preys upon are those who are out from the body of Christ, who no longer in fellowship with the body of believers. It's like the, the illustration that we may have heard for many years, the idea of removing a coal from the fire. And eventually that coal, the fire, the heat will come from it, will go out of it, and it finds itself just, 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 just going, just turning into ash. We can be the same way. If we're not involved in the body of Christ, if we are not surrounded by a fellowship of like-minded believers to encourage us on our bad days, to, uh, that we may return that encouragement when we see that when someone else is falling. Friends, what happens is the enemy comes along and finds them as easy prey because there's no one to give them encouragement. Once you're by yourself, once you're alone, we get this idea, well, they've all forgot about me. They don't care about me anymore. And then the enemy begins to play with these words in our mind and suddenly we, we, we concoct this story about, well, you know, the body of Christ was just, it was just a waste of time anyway. The fact that, that I was going to be, I was going to find my strength in that particular church. And the next thing you know, you're believing things that are absolutely once again a lie. Why? Because we become easy prey. The line that's come along has found us someone that he can, he can easily pull away from the rest of the pack. But be advised, and we know this to be a fact as, as well, there are those who are strong, people of influence, pastors, community leaders, that in a moment of weakness, in a moment of not being alert, they find their guard is down, and next thing you know, they're being chewed on by that line. And the work of the Lord, the work of the kingdom has been, has been held to a detriment because of what's taken place, because of that moment of weakness. And Peter's admonition is always be on the alert because we have an enemy. He does not mean us well. 
As I said a while ago, he doesn't just want to ruin our day or cause us to have a bad week. He wants us to be destroyed and our witness with that. And it's interesting the way he said it. He said that because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings, is it not possible that time every now and then that we get to the place where we think, you know, listen, why is the devil picking on me? I mean, this person, that person, they, got, they haven't got a care in the world. Why, God, why have you left me in this particular situation? And what Peter says is, no, 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 no. Don't go down that road. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself. Because the very minute that you think that you're the only one that's being picked on, you need to be reminded, no, you've got, there's people all around you that are suffering like you and worse for the cause of Christ, for the testimony that they're trying to live out in this world. The devil does not take a holiday from his hunt for unsuspecting, unsuspecting believers. The secret is to stand firm on the word of God, which I assume it seems to be a natural segue into our, to our fourth point, which is this. Your enemy counts on your ignorance. Now, when I wrote that, it didn't sound as offensive as it did when I said it out loud. But the truth of the matter is the enemy depends upon us not to be able to respond to him in a way that's authoritative. He's counting on the fact that we don't know at any particular given moment in time how we can respond to him and do the most damage. Let me give an example of what this looks like in the opposite way, okay? Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I didn't put those words on the screen because I'm just going to go through them very, very quickly. But this is the occasion when Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. At the very beginning of his ministry, it says that he went into the, into the, uh, into the, uh, into the wilderness and he had nothing to eat and he was there alone in prayer with fellowshipping with, with the Lord for 40 days, 40 nights. It says that the tempter, we now know him to be the devil, Satan, if you will, comes and he, appro he approaches Jesus. And he says, Jesus, you know, dude, you gotta be, you're bound to be hungry. You do realize that as the son of God, you can tell these stones to become loaves of bread. How did Jesus respond? No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the high part of the temple. And he said, you know, you're the son of God. Jump off because the scripture says if he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt the, your foot on a stone. And Jesus said also, the scriptures say, you must not test the Lord your God. And then he took him to a high, very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give it to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. And Jesus responded, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And at that last rebuke, it said that Satan left him and the angels came to minister to Jesus. Now, what's the point? The point is that every time there was, there was an altercation, every time there was an accusation or a temptation, Jesus was able to respond knowing the word of God. Now, Jesus was able to get, quote, chapter and verse. Why? Because he wrote it, okay? So he, he, there was no issue with him. That's not always the case for you and me. Not always can we pull that verse out. Well, I know what this, I know what it means. I know this is what we're supposed to do, but I, I but but here, but here, I know this part. And we'll look back at Satan and say, this is not what I'm going to do because this is detrimental because, to God because I am a child of his and I'll bring in every verse I possibly can to, re to, to respond in a way that comes from the word of God. He gives us the ability. The scripture says the Holy Spirit will give us the word that we can respond with in that moment of accusation. And that's what happens here. Friends, there is always a time where we know that God is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He's told us that he, he is an ever-present help in times of trouble. We remember that. Can we give, can we give the, the Bible reference? Probably not. But at the moment that you need it most, you know, these are the promises of God. These are the things that he's given me. The devil counts on us in our moment of weakness 
of not remembering that which is meant the most to us at a particular moment in time. This is why, friends, this is why we can't allow our time in the house of God, our time in the Word of God, to dissipate. We can't allow it to become secondary. One of the things that we do at Adult and Teen Challenge, these are for guys and girls that perhaps have never opened a Bible in their life, is we teach them how to begin to commit their heart and their mind to the memorization of Scripture, of understanding where things are in the Bible so that they can find it on their own. The Word of God is central to everything that we teach because it is central to every battle that we will fight if we hope to be victorious. Now sadly, I know this is not the case in Stewart Heights Baptist Church, but I can tell you that it is the case in many others, is that we have a, um, a gradual decline and a gradual infiltration of of understandings, if you will, societal and cultural uh, norms that are, that are becoming just a part of life as we know it, um, as well as, in the many cases, the church. I, I'll give you one specific example because this, this stays with me and probably will stay with me for a long, long, long time. Um, in a church I served several years ago, there was a young lady who came up to me during, it was after, after the service or in between Sunday school and church. She came up and she says, uh, David, I think I've got a problem. And I said, well, what's that? And she says, um, her, she and her husband had just moved to Chattanooga from the Midwest and they had gotten involved in a Sunday school class and they were having a great time in their Sunday school class. They'd made new friends and in, in, enjoying the church. And she came up to me and she goes, David, she goes, we've got a problem. We're gonna have to find a new Sunday school class and we, Sunday school class, and we may have to go to another church. And I said, well, heaven forbid, what, what, what's going on? She said, well, this was around Thanksgiving, somewhere in that time. And she said, uh, because my, our Sunday school class is, 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 is uh, getting ready for their, uh, uh, making arrangements for the Christmas party. And she says, and I just found out there's going to be an open bar. And uh, she says, David, she says, I don't know if you know this, but she says, my husband's been an alcoholic for 30 years and she, he's been sober for a short period of time. And she goes, I don't understand. She says, there's no way we can continue to fellowship where this is going to be something that he's going to be subjected to. And of course, I was kind of just, I was kind of like stunned because I couldn't believe what she was telling me was the truth. I later found out that it was. And as much as we teach the word of God day in and day out, you would think that somewhere we could pick up the, 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 the whole of the thing, the, the whole of the teaching in regarding a particular issue, which, is so, which is so, uh, can be so detrimental. The idea of alcohol is very close to my heart, especially now in the work that I do. And the idea that the Scripture does not say that you can't partake of alcohol, but you should not partake wherein there is of excess. Of excess. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. David, there's nothing in there that says that you can't have a drink here or there for whatever reason. But there is a scripture that says anything that I consider my freedom, I cannot utilize and take advantage of if it causes my brother or sister to stumble. Anything that I can find a proof text for that allows me to embrace something in my Christian freedom that causes someone else to stumble is wrong. That's with a capital R, wrong. Thank you for laughing. But that, the issue is this. Friends, we come to a place in our, in our culture where everything goes, anything goes. And it's come to the place where because there are so many churches that are trying to, to validate the reason for remaining on their property and becoming open to everything is they have become open to everything. And they don't consider that in the middle of us being open to everything and enjoy our freedom, we've got those who are weak. And the weak must be protected in the name of God. Jesus talked about in, in, in Matthew, the latter part of Matthew, he's talking about the things that you do for the least of these the way you show grace, the way you show mercy to those who don't have and can't do. Those are the ones that Jesus says, you're my children. You're the ones who've been faithful. You're the ones who are taking care of those who need it most. 
And friends, what happens is we get to a place that, that the enemy counts on us being ignorant of what the Word of God says and allows us to embrace anything that the world can throw at us. Friends, the church is not that desperate that we come to the place where we can no longer stand for the truth. Thank you. That was a good place for that. Made me feel a whole lot better. Because I know this is not a pleasant subject. And I know that in, in, in many places, and, in, and I, I, didn't, I did not seek Gary's approval for this little rant that I'm on right now, so you can't hold him responsible for it. But I'm simply saying, friends, I can tell you that I get to witness the, the aftermath of alcohol, drugs, of every and everything. Everything is a gateway to something worse. And unfortunately, we're reaping the horrible benefits of that in our churches today. Well, let's get to the good part. Last part, the last thing about your enemy is your enemy hasn't got a prayer. And I saved the best for last, and I want to use this, these, these verses because to me they're some of the most triumph verse, triumphant verses that we have in all of Scripture, and I wouldn't have known this had it not been for a, for a class I took years ago. It put it in a different perspective. But um, on this night that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that uh, he said to them in Matthew 26, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away once more, and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Luke's account of this same passage says that on that night as Jesus was praying, it said that his sweat became as great drops of blood. And when many years ago I was in this class in seminary and the professor put it in a way I'd never heard this particular evening. But he said, you know, because we talked about the sweat, the great, the great drops of blood and everything that Jesus, the agony that Jesus was in and the finding his father's will. And I, and I, mean, I mean, as a child growing up and reading these passages, I thought, you know, it meant something dear, near and dear to me that Jesus would be in such agony over these things. But the way he put it, 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 was, it was quite interesting. He said, you know, did you realize that on this particular night in the garden, that it was at that place that Jesus fought and won the greatest and final victory with his humanity. Jesus was 100% God, was he not? Jesus was 100% human, was he not? And on that night, he was play, in, in the garden as he was there by himself, facing with, with his face to the ground, pleading with his father, if there's any way that I can, I, can, I can accomplish your will, if there's any way I can do this other than what I'm about to do, then it'd be a great time to let me know about that right now. But the answer that God gave was no. This is my will for you. This is the path that you will need to walk. It was... The contention of my professor, and to this day, I, I, it, 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 just, it gives me chills to think that on that night, as he got up off that ground, there was going to be absolutely nothing that was going to keep him from the cross. Wonderful songs have been written about what Jesus could have done on the cross. He could have called a thousand angels to come and remove him off of the cross. He could have done this. He could have done that. And, 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 the, and, and, and victoriously, he would have come down from the cross. But there was no way, once he got off the ground, he was on a, on a, on a beeline course for the cross. And nothing, if he had to carry the cross, if somebody had to help him carry the cross, he was going to bear up under the weight of the beating he was going to bear up under the weight of all the false accusations. He was going to bear up under the weight of his, of his father turning his back 
Why? Because his father's will was all that mattered. It was foreordained that he be on a cross for all humanity to see because the scripture would say that where I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Did it not? But when he was on the cross paying the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, the enemy was forever defeated with the power of sin and its reign and its right to rule over humanity in that moment. And when he went into the grave, the grave was a victory lap of God's grace because when he came out of that grave, he did something that no human had ever done and walk into a victorious life, letting everyone know that sin and death had no more control over God's creation. That's why our enemy does not have a prayer because of the prayer that Jesus prayed on his face that night. The Father's will was all he was about. Friends, we are doing battle with a defeated enemy. We know it. And he knows it. His power is limited. But let me tell you where he does his most serious damage. He does his most serious damage when we forget that he is there. We come to church. We lift up the praises of Jesus as we've already done here in this place. Today in this house twice. And we talk about the goodness of God, the greatness of the gospel, and we forget that there is an enemy out there who wants to take everything, everything that's going to happen to us this week, and he wants to spin it in our ear. In the middle of, in the middle of a normal week, something may happen that we did not see coming, a prognosis, a diagnosis, an accident, some kind of heartache, some kind of grief will come our way. And if we're not careful... We will hear in our ears the same voice that Eve heard when she heard the devil say in the garden, did God really say? To each one of us in this room, I say, did God really say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Did God really say, I will be your very present help in time of trouble? Did God really say? And in those moments, if we're not careful, if we're not walking in the Spirit, we may hear, well, you know, I think God was with me. I can remember back when I went to that church back there those years ago. Now, I really felt God moving there, but right now, I don't know what's going on. This has gone wrong. That's gone wrong. This, this, this is going, the, the kids are not where they're supposed to be. Uh, you know, the health is not where it's supposed to be. And we can concoct this story in our mind of how God has abandoned us. And that's when he has us. And that's why, my friends, we have to know our enemy. Our enemy is a liar. Our, the worst thing that can happen to our enemy is for us to get up in the morning and to, be, and, and, and to be filled fresh and anew with his Holy Spirit. That we're willing to die one more day to self, allow, allow Jesus Christ to rule in us. That's the worst thing that our enemy can deal with. It's someone who's walking in the power that the Holy Spirit has promised that will be there if we will but ask for it. Be encouraged. He's roaming. He's looking for you. But he can't lay a hand on you when you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you, I thank you Father, for this day. I thank you, Father, for these folks who have been so patient. Father, I pray, Lord, as we've gathered in this place, there's so many faces I don't know by name, face, situation. But, Father, you do. And Lord, you know the circumstances that they live with even now. You know what they walked away from just to be here this morning. Lord, you know what's awaiting them, Father, when they go back home. For some, Father, that's, that's, that's a new week of work tomorrow, and we don't know what's going to be, what, what there's going to be to deal with this coming week. But Father, I pray, I pray for my brother and sister in this room Lord, that they will be victorious this week. For, Father, we were not designed to survive this life. 
We were designed to be victorious over it. And we can do that, Father, only because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Only because, only when we appropriate the power of the cross, only when we apply the blood to our weaknesses and our sins, only then, Father, can we be, can we be strong where otherwise we would be weak. But I pray for everyone in this room, Father, that they might know the strength and the power that comes from being a child of God. That we would need not to fear any enemy, but to be ever vigilant and prepared for when he arises. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the, your, 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 your willingness, Father, to be with us and walk with us through the battles. We thank you, Lord, that it's just not scripture that we can look to, but Father, we know it to be fact that when we are weak, then we're strong through your presence. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Head closed. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Christ. Um, you know, Satan will lie to you. He'll make statements like this. He says that God could never love you. Look at your life. That's exactly, he wants you to, he wants you to doubt him. As David so eloquently put it, uh, hath God said. You see, Satan knows that if he can get you to doubt the word of God, you will eventually deny the word of God. And maybe some of you are in here and you have some questions. You just don't know my life, Brother Gary. You just don't know what I've gone through and there's no way God could ever forgive me. Could he? The answer is absolutely yes. Paul writes in Romans 5, 8 and says that while we were not churchgoers, not while we were Sunday school attenders, not while we were Bible readers, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's at that moment that Christ died for us, at our very worst. And if you're here today and you wonder if Jesus can save you, Hebrews says he's able to save us to the uttermost. That's gotta be a decision you make in your own heart. I like to call it the ABCs of salvation. A, you have to admit, first of all, you can't do this on your own. You can't be good enough. You can't be righteous enough. The Bible says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not gonna stand before God and say, I'm here because I'm a good person. Nope, you'll never make it then. It's not based upon your goodness. Someone says, how about righteous deeds? I got baptized. What, baptized that's wonderful, but that won't take you to heaven. Paul says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Then what am I supposed to do, Gary? B, believe that Jesus died on a cross for you. He paid your sin debt. When he cried out, it is finished, it was finished. It was paid for, paid in full. Then C, claim him as your Lord and Savior. If you're willing to do that, you can have that relationship with the living God. You can know that your sins are forgiven, you're on your way to heaven, but that's a choice and a decision you need to make. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we're gonna to talk to God, and if you've never done that, whether you're watching through streaming or you're here this morning in an auditorium and, and you wonder, does God really love me that much? And yes, everything in the word of God affirms that, that God loves you that much. With heads bowed and eyes closed as we talk to God, maybe you would say something like this. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he was buried and I believe he rose again the third day. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior today. I give you my life to do with it as you please. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you, play, if you prayed in earnestness, then you're, hey, God has written your name in the Lamb's book of life. You say, is that easy, Brother Gary? I never said it was easy because that's a challenge whether you meant it or not in your heart and life. You made that decision. You were serious about that. I can tell you this, that God means business with you. I think before you leave today, you ought to let somebody know you made a decision like that. There's a new name written down in glory and it's your name. Some of you in here today, you know Jesus is Lord and Savior and it breaks your heart because you got family and friends that are without Jesus. 
A couple weeks ago, we had a name that you wrote at the very top. I hope you've been praying for that person, looking for opportunities and an opening to be able to share the gospel with them because it's only then that it makes a difference in their life. You say, I've talked to them several times. Well, hey, listen, go back again. Ask God for some guidance and direction and ask God for that opportunity. You'll be amazed at what God can do. Heavenly Father, we just want to say we love you today. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for sending your son to pay our sin debt. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, how he works and moves in the lives of people, makes them aware of their need for you. And Father, for those that pray today to receive you, to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that they'll feel your presence. They'll understand and know that they'll be able to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We just want to thank you, give you praise for all that you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, thank you for being here today. If you made a decision to follow Christ, you can do us a favor. Matter of fact, we have a little card. It's in front. It's an envelope. Uh, I know it looks like an env offering envelope, but it's, it's more than that. It's an information card for us to help us. If you want some information, uh, maybe you made a decision today, follow Jesus. Put, just put your name on that card and give us a way we can contact you. We'd love to reach out to give you some information on how to be able to grow in your Christian walk in faith. If you have a special prayer request, you've been praying for something, don't do it alone. Let other people pray with you. On that card, you can write out a prayer request. Just write uh, your prayer request. Um, I like putting a name down. You don't have to put their whole name down, but if you're praying for uh, Jan or for, for Bob or whatever like that, uh, go ahead and put their name on there. It's all, it's, I think it's always better to pray for somebody by name than just uh, an unspoken prayer request, but to be able to do something like that. But uh, if you take that card, matter of fact, it's also an offering envelope. Uh, uh, you can give uh, by uh, texting as well. Uh, so those are some options that you can do um, when supporting our ministries of our church. And David, I appreciate it, uh, what a great investment it is uh, in the ministry that you have. Uh, I just say this, I, I look at all what the world has to offer. They have these weekend things you can go away to for two days and, as though they're going to help. That doesn't help. A person's gone through substance abuse their whole life. A, a week doesn't help. A month doesn't help. This is a commitment, and it changes lives, and it's the power of Jesus Christ in life. So we praise God for that. Um, in, a few, in two weeks, uh, we have our church picnic, and we're going to be having a baptism there. Uh, you saw all the baptisms at, uh, uh, at uh, um, Teen Challenge and all the people that, whose lives were changed. Now, let me say this. Baptism doesn't make you saved, all right? It means you are saved. It's the first step of lordship that you'll ever take in your life. It's following through in believer's baptism. Whether you're serious or not, or you prayed that prayer today, if you're listening on streaming and you prayed, we'd love for you to join us and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. That's when you know that it's real and genuine with you. So that's some opportunities. Why don't you watch this uh, little video right here? Make plans to join us on Sunday starting at 5 p.m. down at Chester Frost Park between the beach and the boat dock where we've typically held our annual baptisms. Remember to bring a lawn chair or maybe a blanket to sit on. For this year's picnic, we'll be serving old-fashioned hot dogs, chips, and a cold drink. We're always so excited about our annual baptisms at the lake. It's the annual church picnic and lake baptisms at Chester Cross Park on Sunday starting at 5 p.m. Make plans to join us starting at 5 p.m. down at Chester Frost Park between the beach and the boat dock where we've typically held our annual baptisms. Make plans to join us on Sunday starting at 5 p.m. down at Chester Frost Park. If you saw the bottom of that, you saw where you can register if you'd like to get baptized. You can just call the church office if you want to. Uh, to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, but uh, um, I know that uh, sometimes you have not because you ask not. A lot of people don't want to get baptized here. They understand there's like 500 steps all the way up there, and it's like, that's an awful long thing, journey, and all those people looking at me. Well, this is a great opportunity at the lake to be able to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. A lot of people would say they want to do it that way. I mean, that's the way it is in the Bible. It's outdoors, stuff. They didn't have baptistries or whatever, but we love the convenience of a baptistry. But if you'd like to get baptized, that'd be wonderful. Do it at the lake. Maybe you have some friends that have never been baptized by immersion. 
Uh, I talked to uh, some folks uh, that are Presbyterian and are, uh, who uh, are great friends of our church. But anyways, I talked to them and uh, the church they went to, First Presbyterian downtown, uh, I'm trying to remember the pastor's name. What, anybody remember his, uh, the name, the, the guy that was really famous? Ben Hayden, there you go, okay. I could not remember that name for, for the life of me. So Ben Hayden told his own, by the way, Ben Hayden was a Baptist and didn't know it. Here you go. He, I mean, he was a premillennialist. Uh, uh, he believed, and he said, listen, if you can be baptized by immersion, by all means be immersed, right? So instead of just that little dab of do ya, you follow through in believer's baptism. And that fa- whole family that we know followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Even though they had been saved, knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they wanted to make sure they were baptized by immersion. This is a great opportunity. So it's gonna be here in a couple weeks. Sign up. You don't have to, all you gotta do is bring a towel, Okay. And by the way, you don't have to bring any food either. We're gonna supply some wonderful, wonderful Southern food, hot dogs, amen, right? So look forward to seeing you all. God bless you. You have a great week. See you.